Hi, I'm Saida Garrett, co-writer of Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mr. Mark Tara. The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the persons appearing on the program. Today on Rainbow Country, he's had two number one Canadian jazz albums. Queer artist Mika Barnes joins me in conversation to talk about being the official vocal coach for season two of Canada's Got Talent. All that and more lies ahead on episode 326, so stay tuned for Gay Talk Radio right here on Rainbow Country. Hi, this is Carol Pope. Hi, I'm Garrett Conley, author of Boy Erased, a memoir. Hi, I'm Lorraine Segato. Hi, I'm Gord Depp of the Spoons. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Well, hello and welcome to a brand new journey through Rainbow Country. As I like to call it, a little gay radio show working to give voice to the LGBT community and beyond. And as always, I am your tour guide through Rainbow Country. I'm producer and host, Mark Tara. By the way, Rainbow Country originates from CIUT-FM in Toronto, and now proudly in syndication on 12 outlets across Canada, from coast to coast to coast. The Yukon, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, the east coast of Canada in Newfoundland, Ontario, even down to Buffalo, New York, and online. Well, thanks to you tuning in, Streaming, downloading, but ultimately, listening. Together we continue to build Rainbow Country into a nationally syndicated gay radio show, a number one LGBT podcast on Podomatic.com's Gay and Lesbian Chart, as well as being recognized as Canada's number two LGBT podcast on Feedspot.com. So today... Canadian queer jazz artist Mika Barnes joins me in conversation to talk about signing on to season two of Canada's Got Talent as their official vocal coach. He also recently signed to Canadian record company Alma Records. And by the way, to date, Mika Barnes has had two number one Canadian jazz albums. Plus an hour two music from LGBT artists, independent artists, Voices that we've come to know and love in classic disco, classic 80s, classic house. And on this episode, I'm featuring some 80s, some queer indie, and more. All that lies ahead as we start Journey 326 through Rainbow Country. And our first stop is what I like to call the Rainbow Country School for Canadian Gay History. And today's lesson from activist, author, and historian Tim McCaskill... Canada's Gay and Lesbian Liberation Movement. In the 60s, before the internet, to find each other, queer people needed to actually get together in real space and real time. Since most places didn't tolerate our kind, depending on where you were, your options could be limited. Large cities might have a few specialized commercial spaces, but in the absence of those, it was basically public washrooms, parks, or house parties. They all had their downsides. Commercial spaces required you to spend money, and that's one of the reasons why they were mostly for men. Even in places as big as Toronto, there was seldom more than one lesbian bar at a time. Lesbians earned about 60% of the male wage and probably had more dependents. The economy just wasn't there. The old adage was, gay men go to restaurants, lesbians hold potlucks. Washrooms and parks were also pretty much boys only and could be dangerous, plus parks in the Canadian winter, not so good. You could freeze your willy off. House parties, you needed to know somebody, or know somebody who knew somebody, and so on, and be invited. In terms of commercial life, Montreal had led the pack, developing a sin city reputation during Prohibition in the U.S. in the 1930s, and where there's sin, there's always a place for us. Toronto the Good and Vancouver took a bit longer, but in 1974, Toronto had enough anonymity and a critical mass to produce a small commercial scene. 
At first, it was mostly straight bars where we were tolerated in a corner as long as we behaved. Next came a few straight-owned venues that served gay clientele. By the mid-70s, a new class of gay entrepreneurs emerged and started to open up on Church Street where rents were cheaper. But not everybody lived in Toronto or Montreal. In smaller centres, where businesses couldn't meet community needs, the lesbian and gay liberation movement of the 70s came up with a new model. Defy economics and do it for ourselves. We might not have a lot of capital, but we did have free labour. For example, the Lesbian Organization of Toronto established a non-profit community centre in a ramshackle old Victorian house in 1977. It held dances and brunches and drop-ins and provided meeting spaces and a coffee house and hosted a phone line for a whole generation of women. Loot, as it was known, was following a strategy already developed elsewhere. In Saskatoon, the Zodiac Friendship Society opened its community centre in 1973. Edmonton and Calgary soon followed suit. HALO, the Homophile Association of London, Ontario, started in 1974, and the Halifax Gay Alliance for Equality first began running dances in the turret in 76, and later turned that into a community centre. By the end of the decade, there was a network of lesbian and gay groups providing community spaces in dozens of medium-sized centres across Canada, volunteer-run and community-controlled. This is Tim McCaskill, a gay liberation dinosaur from another planet and author of Queer Progress. Hi everybody, this is Gino Vanelli. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Up next, jazz artist Mika Barnes. When in Spain, for reasons I don't explain, I remain enjoying a brew. Don't deplore my fondness for fun to door. You know how a fun to door can lead to a few. And baby, when in Rome, I do as the Romans do. Mika Barnes, hi, how are you? I am in a weirdly fantastic mood, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I have to say thank you for being on Rainbow Country again to have your voice, your story uh, be continued. Uh, to be. I am always so happy to talk to you. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And like I was saying, to have your your story be continued to be heard by the LGBT community and beyond. Thank you for that, Mr. Mika Barnes, especially to talk about all things you today, all things you, 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 and you. Okay, I want to start here. I want to start here. Okay. 1992. 1992, a musician by the name of Peter uh, Card. Cardin Cardinali. That's it, Cardinali, yeah. Started Alma Records, a yes. Canadian record company with major label distribution. Yeah. You, Mika Barnes, are now signed to Alma Records. Congratulations. Talk to me about the signing and how this came to be. Peter and I have been musical friends for a while. You know, he's so deeply respected in the business. And um, you know, I was like, I really had a lot of momentum on Vegas Breeze, my last album, mm-hmm. partly thanks to support of people like yourself and your show and the a number one jazz album. You know, people did that. Like, I didn't do that. Yeah. People had to do that. And we felt the momentum, and Peter saw the momentum, and he liked the music. And we had, I brought him out to see a few shows, and he just kind of, we just started a relationship where we started talking. Mm. Let's start talking. And we started talking about what we might do together. And it came quite organically. We've got um, giant support from Universal Music Canada, Mm -hmm. who really believe in the project and uh, 
who want to work with us um, in distributing and marketing this this uh, w the music we're going to make together. So I sort of went, okay. So I've got the in I've got the love and care of a boutique jazz label. I've got the clout and the money of a larger, big label, international mm -hmm. label. There's nothing wrong here. I think we can do this. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> So this this collaboration was something that was it something that you sought out or was it something that came to be uh organically or a really combination organic. of you of know, all of those What a great question that is. I'm going to say it like this and I think you and your listeners will understand especially as a member of the LGBT plus community. I started vibrating at the size that I actually am. And the universe started to support me in my largeness. I was like, well, apparently since the Spotify blew us up in France, we're, we need to make an international release. Who's going to help us with that? You know, so I was talking to people and there was nobody more set up than Peter. So I did reach out to him initially, but he and I have been in conversation for a couple of years. It's been a really organic, slow development. So we know each other. We got to know each other before we got into business, you know? And so that's a really very organic process. I feel like I've made a new family member or a new member of my band or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just you just mentioned Spotify blowing you up in, in a good way. Yeah. In yes. France. <laughs> what happened? Yeah. I released I released a song called When in Rome mm -hmm. and we had a clever little video that we shot in Italy and I think what happened was everybody loved the song because the jazz radio around the world started playing it and Spotify really went on the song we got on you know some of those editorial playlists especially in France I don't know why France went crazy for it but it's romantic it's a bossa nova. It's very playboy, playboy having fun in Europe kind of song. Originally, uh, Peggy Lee, uh, Tony Bennett classic. And uh, I just kind of, I think the vibe of that song really helped us internationally. We released at least four singles, maybe five from Vegas Breeze. And that's the one that seemed to connect to people, you know. <laughs> You're based in, in Canada, in Toronto, and as a Canadian musician, as a Canadian jazz artist, do you find it easy to be an artist here in Canada? Or do you ha have to, you know, sow your oats abroad, like in France, like other places, like in America, really? where you had a number one, you know, dance club single? Yeah, America's been kind to me. Um, you know, you learn a lot releasing music internationally. Canada is very nurturing, but it's a small population. So if we ring the bell here, then I think most artists are want to, are going to want to have a chance to crack the international market. I'm no different. The nylons took me off of Queen Street and put me into a global perspective. And I've never lost that. Um, so even when I've been touring and releasing in Canada, I've always thought, I've always kept my eyes open for the opportunity to return to the international market in a more aggressive way. Um, it really has to do with um, there's no, like Canada is now no longer isolated. Every single release you make anywhere in the world gets to go global now that music is so, so online and available. There's less borders now to worry about. Mika Barnes, you've had two number one jazz albums, I believe 2015's New York Stories and 2020, 2020's Vegas Breeze. Yeah. Will these two albums get an Alma Records release, do you think, at some point? You know, we're talking about it, um, especially with Vegas Breeze, which seems to have you know really caught people's imagination. I think that's because it was was released at the E on the eve of the pandemic and you know it was it's a very feel good like you know party with a drink in your hand uh, dance in the kitchen type of album and I think people were ready for some fun times in the middle of their pajama and Netflix adventures 
Uh, and so, uh, you know, we're, Peter and I are talking about that, but um, we're rolling up our sleeves for some new music because we really want to kind of, we're, we're anxious to get into the, into production mode together. So we're going to start with some new stuff and then we'll certainly look at going back and revisiting a couple of those hmm. records. How do you think your, your collaboration with Alma Records, how do you think that will evolve your record, your recording process? Well, for the first Having time. Having your support behind you now. Yeah, it, it's, well, number one, I'm going to be collaborating with a producer who is not myself because hmm. um, I've been producing the records sometimes with my brother and certainly in coll in collaboration with my engineer, John Beetle Bailey. And the band has been working the arrangements with me as well as Don Brightup and Ricky Franks. But I do have a feeling like Peter, who has a lot of hits under his belt, big records that have gone international, and he's got a real way in the studio having been an architect architect of many 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 albums i'm going to learn i'm going to grow i'm going to be in the sandbox playing with someone new so there'll be all the natural sort of exciting new adventure of learning how each other operate he's got a lot of strong ideas so do i so i'm sure at some point we'll have a little little sand fight but uh, <laughs> as kids do in the sandbox but Peter's awesome, and I think what we'll probably end up doing is making a leap into where I've wanted to go musically for a long time, which is a little bit more mainstream, a little bit more high fidelity in the sound, and a little bit more user-friendly for radio and for, um, you know, the major playlists. I think that's where we're going with this album. If you were to liken that idea and that sound to an existing artist, who would you compare it to potentially? I think there's a chance that we'll be a little closer to the world of Michael Bublé and mm -hmm. Diana Krall mm -hmm. and a little less the, you know, sort of indie jazz label sound. Mm. You know, I think we're going to go a bit more big budget on this mm. one. Well said. Can't wait. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> You're like, Mark. You can't wait. I can't wait. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. 2022, you signed to Alma Records. You are now going to be on season two of Canada's Got Talent as the vocal coach. Talk to me about that. Again, I asked you this before. Was this something that you sought out or was this something that came to you? This was a phone call out of the blue from our executive producer who worked with me on How to Solve a Problem Like Maria, which was the CBC casting show for Sound of Music that Andrew Lloyd Webber did. I was lucky enough to be a coach on that show and uh, worked closely with Andrew Lloyd Webber's musical director on there. And uh, Claire remembered me, called me up and brought me in. I started working with the contestants right away. Um, like she called me on a Sunday and I was at the office at 11 a.m. Monday morning. This f TV moves quickly, right? It's like, you're like, oh, suddenly I'm 24 seven. But I have learned so much. So it was absolutely out of the blue. I did not expect it. And um, I could not be more delighted. I love the team and I feel really well supported in the work I do on the show. They're really trying to make the best TV possible. Um, it's such a, such a sort of powerful international franchise. We want to get it right this season. And um, they brought me on board to help sort of support and produce the music sequences in a way that would really support the talent and show them off in the best possible light so Canada will fall in love with them. Mm. Will you be coaching the musical acts or all the acts that will be on the show? Just the singers, not okay. the circus acts and <laughs> not the dancers. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and I'll be coached, so I'll just be coaching the singers, which mm -hmm. will be a, an absolute honor. And have you s started that process? Yes. Oh, okay. And have they started filming season two? We're not in filming yet, but we're just in pre-production and, and getting things moving. Wow. How do you, how are you finding it? Um, 
I love it. I was built for the pace of television. My mom wrote Mr. Dress Up when I was a kid. Wow. And for those who are young and don't know, it was the longest running and highest rated kids program in Canada. Mm -hmm. So I would beg to go to the studio with mom on her studio days. Please take me with you. And then I would sit in the, in the control room and, and watch how they made the show, like how the director and how the camera people and just how they put it together was so interesting to me. And I've because my mom wrote for TV and radio, I've always had a little bit of a... A kind of a different perspective on television and um, I feel very comfortable working in the context I think I I earned my stripes by osmosis so the pace suits me the um, the level that we're trying to achieve in terms of entertainment for because this is the last this is basically the new form of variety show for mainstream audiences right and uh, when I was a kid, it was, uh, you know, you still had the old variety shows on television, a few of them. And uh, this is kind of the new version of it. And I love the people I'm working with more than anything, Mark. They're a dream come true for me because there's, there's a lot of respect and a lot of um, mutual admiration. We're, 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 we're quite a happy gang, which, you know, that's really important when you're working with uh, such high stakes and high pressure. Yeah. And a high budget show. Yeah, you, you know, you better you better like each other because you're going to be arguing about shit. Huh? What What do you think about the state of all these competition shows? You've got you know voice shows, you've got uh, talent shows, all that sort of stuff. What are your thoughts on these shows and the popularity of them? Right. Well, they're built for the audiences for the wow factor, right? Mm -hmm. And that is how you make exciting television. The challenge is always for the artist who wins or who gets support from the show and gets momentum for that artist to be able to spin that into a healthy career. It doesn't happen for many, as we know. You know, for every Jennifer Hudson or Kelly Clarkson, we've got an army of singers that we won't necessarily ever hear from again. And um, Adam Adam Lambert it, like landed nicely singing lead for Queen, but that's not what every guy is going to do. And, um, you know, that's where my own coaching sort of, I, I, I like to mentor long-term artist careers. And that's where I sort of come in, uh, you know, uh, to kind of help artists find their voice, the right material, their, the genre that's really going to suit them the most, finding their brand identity as an artist so that audience understand who they are. Uh, that's that's something that doesn't always happen for the singers on these shows, and it's something that I I really believe in as a coach. It's it's one of my principles is like be be ha think long term health. Who's your audience? How are you nurturing them? And what are you doing to continue to bring them with you on your journey? And uh, unfortunately, for a lot of the singers on these. Cont the contestants on these shows sort of have a big moment and then they don't know what to do next. So that's where a coach or a mentor can come in. I want to take you far away from it all Down in the desert there's a place that I know Just one weekend we can feel that Vegas breeze That Vegas breeze Bring back sweet memories Something blowing in that Vegas breeze One kiss and magically Well, our tomorrow suddenly Became a game for two Come on, let's roll the dice Order something smooth on ice Make our own sweet paradise Underneath And on that musical note, we will return right after this Rainbow Country update.
Hi, everyone. This is Mark Tewksbury, Olympic champion, leader, humanitarian. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. So Rainbow Country airs on independent radio outlets, streaming services, as well as on the NCRA network, the National Campus and Community Radio Association. What do all of these outlets have in common? Well, they are all listener supported to help keep the lights on and the airwaves broadcasting coast to coast to coast. Here are the outlets that carry Rainbow Country. CJUC FM, The Juice, in Whitehorse, Yukon. CJLY FM, in Nelson, BC. CFUR FM, in Prince George, BC. CFCR FM, in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. CKUW FM, in Winnipeg, Manitoba. CIUT FM in Toronto, Ontario, the home of Rainbow Country. CKCU FM in Ottawa, Ontario. Canoe FM in Halliburton, Ontario's cottage country. CFRC FM in Kingston, Ontario. CFRU FM in Guelph, Ontario. CHMR FM in St. John's, Newfoundland. And Bombshell Radio, a 24-7 streaming outlet. So if you are able to, please consider making a donation to this very outlet you are tuned to. If you're listening to the edited podcast version, please consider making a contribution to an outlet that does carry Rainbow Country. And by the way, the full list of outlets that carry Rainbow Country can be found at marktara.com. Just hit the syndication Banner. After all, where else but on Rainbow Country will you find episodes featuring topics like the state of trans healthcare in Canada, being gay and being black, out LGBT athletes, and not to mention playing music from queer artists from around the world. Rainbow Country, a little gay radio show working to give voice to the LGBT community and beyond. And by the way, if you do make a donation, if you do make a contribution, please let me know. Hit me up on my socials, at Mark Tara, or send me a personal email, mark at marktara.com. That way, I can give you the recognition you deserve for letting your support be known nationally. Hi, my name is Joanne Vanicola, and I'm an actor and a writer, and I was first on Rainbow Country with Mark Tara on discussing the massacre at Pulse Club in in Orlando. Um, I realized how important it was for our community to have a radio station, uh, specifically for our issues, to to talk about people in in the LGBTQ community and to provide an outlet for our stories, um, to discuss uh, our politics, culture, and give voice to the to the issues that matter to us, and of course our artists and and um, the things that we do globally, and, and talk about culture. And without people like Mark Tara uh, providing a space for this with with a radio show like this, then uh, we wouldn't have that voice. So support, tune in. Thank you. When did gay pride become just pride? I can answer that for you, and I can answer where the big turnaround was, and it's a very simple thing. Corporatism is when gay pride became pride. As soon as we got corporate sponsors, as soon as we had the approval of the corporations Uh around us, oh my God, the beer company is going to sponsor it, and they're going to give us a float, and look at the telephone company is going to do something, and someone else is going to do something. But drop the gay. Yeah, drop the gay and include everyone. And I always thought, why should we include everyone? This is a gay pride celebration. It is for people who are in a sexual minority. We had something that was for us to make people recognize who we are Mm -hmm. and to acknowledge that we actually existed. 
Award-winning playwright and author Brad Fraser reflects on some important gay history. The time frame? The 1990s. When gay pride becomes pride with the introduction of corporate sponsorships. I'm Brian Bradley, author of Outrageous Misfits, female impersonator Craig Russell and his wife, Lori Russellidi. You are listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. So you're all choked up and you're down in the mouth and you hardly can speak and you're fully convinced that what happened to you is supremely unique and you tell yourself that you shouldn't cry cause you're gonna cry alone Well, you're crying, but you're certainly not alone. Do I hear you saying you got hurt? Did you say that she's a flim flam flirt? Are you saying that some double dealing doll went and did you dirt? Well, bud, welcome, welcome, welcome to the club. Singers Playground. This is your your coaching your practice. Song. And this is where you, you were just talking about having singers, artists develop who they are. People like, what, Tatiana Maslahi is one of your, your, your cohorts. Yes. She's recently been in what, Marvel's She Hulk. Yeah. Have you seen her in it? She's fantastic in it. That must make you feel good. Oh, I'm. They're, you don't. They don't come smarter and more talented and more hardworking than Tatiana. And when she ran up the stairs in my studio, I didn't actually know who she was, and I hadn't watched Orphan Black, and I didn't realize she was about to get an Emmy. Like I was just like, "Hi, let's get to work," because one of the clones in her science fiction show, there, Orphan Black, had to sing, and Tatiana was terrified of singing, and she'd done musicals and didn't hadn't had a good experience. So we made sure that she had a really good experience singing. And uh, there there I am again on a TV set, right? Um, helping an artist do the best possible job they can. And I love that support position because the pressure's on in a different way. And for someone like Tatiana, who just takes what you give her and runs with it, she ends up making me look good, right? So that, that she's just a happy accident. I'm just happy the producers thought of me. Hmm. Are you finding it... Uh, is it complimentary? Is it challenging being an artist yourself, but also being uh, a coach? Do you learn? Are you learning things from your 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 students, from the people that come to see you, and you're imparting your wisdom to them? But are you also getting something from them, seeing maybe the same sort of mistake that artist after artist after artist are making? And you're in the back of your mind, you're thinking, "Uh uh-huh, am I doing this in some way, shape, or form? Wow, no one ever asked me that? That's such a good question. You should have a radio show. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yes. In fact, the most evident to me, like the most obvious example is I constantly preach about having non-negotiables and making sure that people follow through on their dreams on a daily basis in a practical manner you're learning voice technique you got to sing every day you want to write an album's worth of material you better face that empty page once a day and i'm all about those non-negotiables and then when i wake up if i'm not following through on my advice then look who looks foolish and when i look in the mirror so the artist Mika has definitely grown a lot. Um, stage fright used to be a 
big issue for me. And as I continue to coach it in my workshops and privately, I, I've, I've started to be able to conquer it in my own career. And it's because I keep hearing myself over and over, you know, coaching and basically saying the same things, which I now have to follow through on myself. It's been really, really healthy and really organic growth for me. Um, I never set out to be a coach. I just had a knack for it. And, uh, you know, at some point I paid the rent with it. And now as a calling, it's become, you know, as important in my career as my own singing because uh, nurturing the next generation is something that I really, I live for it. You know, coaching is my jam. I just dig it. And it feeds the artist and the artist feeds the coaching. They're really very in sync these days. Mm-hmm. The more that you find yourself on sets, like maybe on Orphan Black or with Canada's Got Talent now, Mm. and those are stages, especially Canada's Got Talent, those are big stages, national stages, international stages, Mm. and they're made for television, they're made for performances. When you're on sets like that, or going to be on sets like that, are you thinking about absorbing ideas, concepts, inspiration for when you will be on stage performing your original music, uh, music, your jazz music. Are you think, are you formulating those sort of thoughts now as you're entering, yeah. you know, season two for yeah. Canada's Got Talent and what you're going to be exposed to? Yeah. You know, what's happening, uh, Mark, is that I'm get I'm becoming uh, a more muscular and high impact performer. I'm recognizing how um, audiences go on a journey with an entertainer, and like you know, um, you know, a, a show like Canada's Got Talent, you've got like two, three minutes to show people what you got. And I realized that you know, and I, whether this is good or bad. I leave it for other people to decide, but the reality is is that we now take on in our performers and our music in bite-sized chunks, right? TikTok, Insta, and the world of music has become like, it's a little more bite-sized. And w- without judging that, I recognize that that is how people are going to perceive me. So if I've got a seven minute ballad that I'm gonna open my show with, I'm probably going to lose my audience. If I've got something hard hitting, and I'll give you an example. We did a two and a half minute version of That's Life by Sinatra. Speed it up as the first single for Vegas Breeze because I wanted impact. I wanted to get in and get out and have you enjoy the hell out of that two and a half minutes. And it helped set up the album because people knew what they were getting by the time we dropped the full length. They knew it would be entertaining. They knew it would be high energy. There'd be horns and girls and I'd be crazy entertainer in the middle of all that and like that sets up the audience's expectations now i've learned that by working in the world of entertainment in the larger world of entertainment like these tv shows and i think that's been helping me get over with audiences in a contemporary uh format especially as you evolve your sound to a bigger more international sound with your collaboration with alma music your performance has to evolve and change and become you know even bigger potentially right yes so it it'll be it'll be interesting to see how that and these experiences that you're 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 doing right now and going to be doing how that transforms you as an artist through your music and through your performances you know what it is it's um I'm the jazz singer that used to be with the nylons. So Mm -hmm. people assume I can do a good show, right? But what they're not ready for is that I show... Now that I'm vibrating at my true size, Mm -hmm. now that I'm really taking the space that I take in the world, because I'm tall, Mm -hmm. a big, tall white man, I come striding into the room and people are like, oh, oh, hi, you take up a lot of room. And I'm like, yes, I do. (laughs) Um, you know, I, when I was a 12 year old gay kid, I was trying not to take up room. Mm. When I was 14, I was trying not to get noticed because that got you beat up. When I was 16, it was just a little bit dangerous still. So my childhood, teen and early 20s that I tried really hard to fit in. I ain't trying to fit in no more. 
you better fit in with what I'm doing or I don't need you in my audience because now that guy that took the stage with the nylons has been unfettered. He is allowed. He has been given permission by mainstream recognition and a label deal and an international distributor. Yeah, people. So like I'm going to I'm going to take the space that I've been given and that I fought for and that I deserve. The word that's coming to me on unapologetic. Yeah. Yes. Own it. I, I'm mm. singing different. Mm. I'm writing different. I'm like leading the band different. I'm asking more of the people that I work with and not in a demanding way, but just a creative way. Mm-hmm. What's what can we do that really, you know, what's a what's a what's a Mika Barnes way of doing this? You're part of the LGBT community. You see the world through that lens, like myself. Yeah. That's who we are. That's who yeah. we are innately. Yeah. Does being part of the community, being a gay individual, how do you think that forms and helps to create your art? Whether it's your music, your performances, your songwriting, your coaching. How do you think that influences your art or or does it? I was sitting with a dear friend, Jen Centuro, who wrote the book You Are a Badass and all that whole series which is 10 years ago. And Jen and I have known each other since we were buddies back in Venice Beach. And she looked at me and she said, you know, part of your magic is that you're gay. And I was like, what do you mean? She says, because it's because you're extra. Your your energy is including the dynamicness of, of male and female energy. You've got sensitivity and empathy and passion and creativity that like uh, some straight guy isn't going to have. And I mean, that's not true. I know some amazing quote unquote straight boys who, who will, you know, out fag at anybody. But the <laughs> fact is, right. But the fact is my magic is part because of my sexuality mm-hmm. I am I do have a feminine ability to live in a more um, emotional and sensitive and spiritual realm and uh, I really feel connected to that part of myself when I'm performing when I'm writing when I'm recording when I'm singing a singer is an emotional being you know Everyone thinks that gay men are so emotional. Yes, we are. And if you can sing it at your face, you have a good chance of surviving this weird world. Hmm. Well said. You know, we got to survive <laughs> it somehow. What are we going to do? You know, I'm using what I was given. You mentioned earlier that uh, you're starting to work on some new music, coming up with ideas, some concepts. Can you share with us what... what what you're able to, what you feel is appropriate, uh, some of those ideas and some of those concepts that we may be able to hear in, say, like 2023 or something with your new collaboration with Alma Records. I would be delighted to. So so I have a theory that um, everyone loves the Great American Songbook. It's the standards written in the, generally, we you know, the 30s and 40s, and some of them in the 50s. And I have a theory, a working theory, that there's a second Great American songbook, which is the pop standards that were written in the 50s and 60s in the Brill Building and sung by the early rock and roll and pop artists who are trying to take that original explosion of rock and roll and kind of have hits on the radio. So tunes written by Carole King, Burt Bacharach, and the like. That is my working... Uh, you know, thesis, as it were, and I've been learning cover tunes from that period of time and really digging in for that Brill Building music, all the early rock and roll and pop hits from, from that era. Because they're smart, they're emotionally powerful, they're three minutes long, they tell the story quick and get out, and they encapsulate something of that fresh new energy that rock and pop had back when the world was young and i absolutely am so attracted to that music and so that's the first order of business would be to sit with a bunch of songs and start to explore which of those i might be able to mika barnes 
the most. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Can't wait. Thank you. Uh, me too. I'm having fun. <laughs> so from Welcome to My Head, your number one Billboard Club hit, to you having two number one jazz albums, here's my last question for you, Mr. Meeker Barnes, and it's simply this. When you, uh, individuals, your audiences hear, see one of your shows, hears one of your songs, uh, listens to one of your albums, what do you hope? your audience comes away with after listening to Mika Barnes? You know, I seek to open them up to the larger possibilities in life. You know, I have a bit of a swagger going when I'm performing, and you can hear it in my singing voice on the records, but I love intimacy and romance as well. So I believe that we're all better off ex when we can express our totality and so for the men and women and uh and uh, gender fluid folks in the audience i'm always about like be all that you are do not accept the limitations the society will put on you and on us let's be everything that's possible um and i believe in that musically that's why you know even though i sing jazz i'm not afraid to sing any kind of thing you know because my voice lends itself to a lot of different kinds of music and genres and feels, you know? So, yeah, it's to me, it's all about express. If I express my totality, that should encourage you to express your totality. And then we're all going to be better off because what the world needs is more of who we really are and a lot less pretending and hiding and trying to fit in, you know? Mm. I lied. I have one, one more question that came to my mind. Blue Radio, would you ever consider redoing that? And re-releasing that, it was one of yes. on one of the Nylons albums, yeah. and so an original song that you wrote. Yeah, yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. I love that <laughs> song. Um, it's a know, great it's so song, funny. Mika Barnes. Thank you. You know, it's so crazy how it happened. I was on tour with the guys. At, you know, at that time we were on tour like eighty uh, percent of the time in America, but often also in Asia and in um, Europe. And uh, I. Whenever we were at a concert hall, I would go and play that song on the, on whatever piano was backstage. And the guys finally went like, can we try that? I'm like, yes. So when we put that arrangement together, it's, it's a lovely arrangement. I'm very proud of, of how the nylons sound on it. Um, I always thought like, oh, I guess eventually I'll do my own version of this. And yes, I would love to re-record that on a future album mm -hmm. it's uh, it's one of my favorite songs if i do say so myself <laughs> it's well done i love that song oh thank you thank you yeah blue radio it was a mood it's that yeah. mood you yeah. know Oof. a mood to end a record that's the that's the thing right <laughs> so yeah maybe it'll be the title of a record one day hey 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 could be mika barnes thank you so much for your time well said well done and well 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 recorded well written thank you thank you such always a pleasure to talk to you i love how deep into the questions you get my friend and congratulations on all your success they say this is the city where we come to live our dreams make our lives a new and if this tale of romance is as magic as it seems my dreams are coming true come take my hand and let's stroll through the park Far from the noise and the crowd Here by the fountain We can dream, we can drift Our New York story Starts with a kid For even more on this number one Canadian jazz queer artist Simply visit MikaBarnes.com 
The phone rings. I get a message from the mayor. He's going to call me back the next day. I get the call, and he said, if you'd accept, uh, would you, we'd like to honor you with the key to the city. There was an event um, later that year in May. Just a key, right? Like, key to what? A decent job, uh, a good singing career. Uh, it's really a metaphor, but it's history. So a reporter wants to talk to me and says, uh, you know, well, so it's key, right? Like, what's the big deal? I said, well, not everybody gets the key. So I looked it up, and I guess it is kind of a big deal. The date, May 17th, 2018, when trans activist Susan Gapka made history by becoming the first trans woman to be presented with the key to the city of Toronto. By the way, past recipients include Rush and the Raptors. My name is Charles Officer, and I'm the writer and director of Invisible Essence, The Little Prince. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. So during my interview with Mika Barnes, I asked him his opinion on on modern day competition shows, you know, music shows, reality shows. Do you remember Star Search with Ed McMahon? I believe it was back in 1987 when Liberty Silver, an award winning Canadian jazz artist, uh, competed on the show and won seven weeks in a row. Liberty Silver would go on to become the first Canadian black woman to receive a Juno Award. To date, she's been nominated for five and has won two. She's been on the show before and I feature her music. She's got an amazing voice. I call her voice Ear Candy. If you haven't heard of Liberty Silver, check her out. Check her out. She's out there on streaming, on YouTube, Available wherever you get your favorite music. Liberty Silver. She was also part of Northern Lights, the Canadian collective that recorded Tears Are Not Enough, Canada's response to the 1985 Ethiopian famine relief efforts. Here's another show, Canadian Idol. Do you remember Canadian Idol? Ran from 2003 to 2008. Well... In 2007, which was season five, the show saw Carly Rae Jepsen. She placed third. In 2011, Call Me Maybe. Remember Call Me Maybe? I like that song. That song became a number one single around the world. Other than Carly Rae Jepsen from Canadian Idol, do you remember any other contestants, any other talent from that show? So here's my point. If you're an artist, if you want to get yourself out there, your name out there, your talent seen, be heard. In 2022, going into 2023, it's never been easier for a creative to have their their abilities, their talents be be spotlighted. You've got platforms like TikTok, YouTube, reality shows, competition shows, all that sort of good stuff. I think the pitfall lies in people that are seeking fame and fortune and they want it. They want it yesterday. And for those people, I think, good luck with that. Good luck with that. Maybe it'll happen. Maybe it won't. Who knows? It's a gamble. But I think that if someone goes into that arena with their eyes wide open, they just might be able to parlay that platform and the the potential notoriety from that platform and parlay that into a long-lasting career. Like Mika Barnes was talking about in our interview, how do you then parlay that opportunity into a sustainable and lasting career? That's the key. And I think going into one of those competition shows with your eyes wide open, knowing that it is an opportunity But it won't last forever, that opportunity. 
Because when the lights dim and the cameras turn off and the glitter fades, where are you left? That's the key. That's the key. Where do you go from there? So again, competition shows, great entertainment if you like that stuff. Great entertainment. Absolutely an opportunity. And for those artists that know themselves and know who they are and what they're about, these competition shows can absolutely be a springboard. As long as they go into these situations, in my opinion, with their eyes wide open, because what happens once the glitter fades? Hey, this is Rye Daisies, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Bill 7. To ban discrimination in employment, government services, and housing, based on a person's sexual orientation, was up for a vote at Queen's Park. Most NDP and Liberal MPPs supported the bill, but without some progressive conservative legislators backing, a divisive split could rack the province. Four PCs decided to break party ranks to vote with their conscience and support Bill 7. Cabinet Minister and MPP Dennis Timbrell did it to show solidarity for his beloved brother, the well-known drag queen, Rusty Ryan. And for me, a gay politician who was not yet out, I had to take a stand. We were known as the Gang of Four. I'm former Cabinet Minister and MPP Phil Gillies. The date, December 2nd, 1986, when LGBT rights came to Ontario. And just like that, this little gay journey through Rainbow Country has come to an end. For the full two-hour episode, simply head over to marktara.com, where everything is connected, and hit the archives banner. To keep up to date with the show, check out my socials at marktara. The podcast for Rainbow Country is available on all major platforms, including audible.com and iHeartRadio. And finally, I want to take this time to thank you for taking your time to be with me. Remember, we are living in days of making dreams come true, so believe in yourself, and the world will believe in you. Hi, this is Police Constable Danielle Botno, also known as LGBT Cop, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Terra. Mm. 